So then uh, maybe it's time to uh, go to uh, Jay's second le lecture. Uh, already last week, he gave his first lecture. Uh, well, he talked about his, uh, well, not just his opinion, but also his uh, experience with AI in uh, research mathematics. And today he's going to yeah, focus more really on his, uh, on, on his research results, I would, uh, I would say, and talk about uh, finite time singularities uh, in fluids. Thanks again for uh, for the invitation to to be here and deliver this series of lecture. So <clears throat> yeah, so so last week um, I kind of talked a little bit about the vision and uh, like the interaction between computer and proofs and uh, AI and and <clears throat> all that and mathematics. And uh, and today I'm going to really focus on on concrete examples. I'm trying to really showcase and uh, the power of, of this like synergy that um, that I just described between um, these sort of two worlds, the more computational world and the less computational world the TV, traditional <coughs> okay. So <clears throat> the topic that that I chose for, for today's lecture and uh, as promised in in the first lecture is related to finite time <coughs> similarities through mechanics. Um, so, so let me start, let's say maybe um, with the ending. And this is kind of uh, where we want to go and sort of what <coughs> the direction that, that we're aiming for. Um, so this, uh, these are the <coughs> incompressible Euler, incompressible 3D Euler and incompressible 3D Based of equations. So U uh, is a velocity in R3, <coughs> it's incompressible, so the divergence of U is equal to zero. Uh, P is the pressure, and uh, we have to solve the initial the initial value problem from some initial velocity U0, which is taken to be smooth. And the question is whether for this uh, for this equation, which put uh, a Laplacian, and then it's uh, Navier results or not have that operation at all, and then it's uh, Euler. Uh, whether starting from smooth finite energy, nice initial <coughs> uh, initial data, will there be a singularity in finite time? Okay, so this is kind of the big uh, open question in the field, and it's open for uh, for both cases. Okay, so both the uh, Euler and the uh, and Navier results. And I will be a little bit more precise about and the setups of the problem and uh, throughout the talk. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is sort of where we want to go. Uh, let me also highlight the fact that there has been a lot of activity uh, in the last few years. So there are a bunch of papers uh, going in that direction, not uh, fully resolving the open question in the way that is uh, stated, uh, but nonetheless making substantial progress uh, in some direction. So, so there are some results constructing. Okay, so, so first of all, the answer uh, to the question seems to be yes. Uh, at least that's sort of what the majority of the community believes right now uh, that you can possibly find <clears throat> smooth initial data that at time, let's say one, uh, will blow up, uh, and at time zero, they are nice and tame and, and anything you want. Okay. So in that direction, uh, Elindi and uh, Chen and Hao uh, constructed the uh, blow-up solutions, but they start uh, non-smooth. Okay, and the non-smoothness is sort of uh, technical. I won't uh, I won't discuss it here. Um, so <clears throat> so they proved that the answer was yes, relaxing the initial hypothesis of U not uh, being being smooth. Okay. Um, and then there is another paper, and, and this sort of uh, blow-up behavior happens in <clears throat> an asymptotical in a similar way. Uh, and I will say more about uh, what those words mean in a few slides. And then there is another uh, paper, or a few papers, by Cordova, <clears throat> Martinez, Cordova, and Chen, uh, where they also construct non-smooth blow-up, but this time is not, uh, not self-similar or asymptotically self-similar. Okay? Now, Concerning uh, numerical simulations uh, in the problem, and this is quite important, where the setup has a cylindrical boundary, uh, Guo Luo and Tom Hao 
Uh, so I had very compelling numerical simulations about 10 years ago. And uh, Chen and Tao, uh, in 2023, uh, used a computer system proof uh, to, to prove the existence of this scenario. Okay, so the dream, uh, or in my dream, let's say, is, is to prove final time blow up for this set of equations without boundary. And here, I mean, the boundary doesn't seem to be very important, but, but it really is because the boundary really stabilizes the singularity and gives you an extra hand on, on, on really thinning it down and understanding very well uh, where it happens, how it happens, and so on. So we want to take out that. Uh, <clears throat> and moreover, uh, our plan is to do that using a combination of uh, machine learning, computer system proofs, and classical analysis. Okay, so that, that's sort of, let's say, the, the dream and the goal and the plan for the next uh, who knows how many years. Okay, so that's uh, that's sort of the idea. Uh, let me let me explain a little bit more um, how to turn like sort of this dream into reality. Okay, so so I'm going to even outline a proof. Okay, so so this is how we think the proof is going to work. Uh, and in this community, maybe it's not so surprising <clears throat> kind of things that we're doing, uh, but but you see that it sort of makes sense um, in a way. So step one, uh, find uh, find an approximate similar solution any way you want. Uh, and I, okay, have my own opinion about what is a good way to do that. But but suppose that you have it, then uh, what you really want. So suppose that we have this is uh, infinite dimensional space. So suppose that you have an approximate solution of your equation. Um, <clears throat> Then what you really want is to prove a stability. Okay, that's usually a luxury. You won't be able to prove stability because uh, it's going to be an untrivial, unstable manifold. Um, so what you want to prove is, in some finite dimension space, the existence of some sort of trap in region. So you want to find some neighborhood, and here I'm going. I'm not being very precise on purpose, such that. If you hit the boundary, you go inside. This is all in some similar coordinates. Now, <clears throat> whenever this is as S, which is the similar variable, um, goes to infinity. Now, what, what happens? Well, <clears throat> given the picture, and again, I'm cheating a little bit because there is the unstable manifold that I'm not drawing, um, you will never leave this region. Now, any point, in this region, when pulled back from some similar <laughs> coordinates to X T coordinates, is going to blow up. Okay, so we have sort of now. Now, what is the upshot? The upshot is that here everybody is fine. Like there are no singularities, there are no infinities. Um, everything here is controlled, let's say, and the <clears throat> problem has been recast into really making sure that these arrows are in place. Okay, and finding the initial dot. Uh, to start with, whether you converge here or you converge here or you have a periodic orbit or something else happens, I don't care. I mean, proving this is more than enough for me because anything inside here is going to blow up. So that will lead to the blow up, and I'm happy with that. So, so that's <clears throat> that's kind of the goal. Um, how to do that? Well, we've seen <clears throat> a few talks today where the strategy is that, okay, the, the linear X operator is a mess. Nobody understands it. It's very difficult, and you don't have any good structure. So let's hope that at least we can sort of um, write it as some finite dimensional part uh, plus something that we can understand a little better, or we can bound a little better, maybe it's relatively <clears throat> compact to the, uh, to, the, to the main part, to the uh, to the part that we understand, um, <clears throat> usually it won't. Um, so that's sort of the idea. Try to really understand uh, the linear X operator, which is at the end of the day what these arrows mean, assuming that this ball is not too big, then the arrows, the direction of the arrows, is dictated by, by the stability of the linear operator. And if so, then we can win. Now, <clears throat> some perks that come with this approach 
He says you can you can put viscosity. You can put a little bit of viscosity, and uh, in a way that will be <clears throat> made more precise later on, so that you could, in principle, add viscosity to your problems uh, as long as it is exponentially small. That I will explain later, uh, and then you can add to the original equation some viscous term. Uh, and then once you have gone through all that, you can upgrade your proof from linear onto nonlinear, which should be okay, uh, assuming that the radius of this ball is not too big. Okay, so there is a lot of numerology going on, uh, and computing this, these arrows is quite difficult, but we'll see how to at least some ideas how to multiply. Okay, so um, I never said what is the PD for this to work. So that's good. Well, it's either very good or very bad, but I think it's very good um, because this can work in many instances. And in fact, we have made it work in some other instances, such as uh, the compressible case. Um, and at least <clears throat> my idea is to use machine learning for the first item and to do the second and third part or the middle part, which is the study of the, of the linear operator invoking a computer assisted proof plus a lot of someone um, but there will be a computer system proof and i will explain in which place okay so so this is the plan this is the plan for quote unquote any equation um and now i'm going to <clears throat> talk about step one uh and later step stability okay so, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about machine learning and this integration between machine learning and, uh, and singularities and PDE and fluids uh, and whatnot. Okay, so just to give an idea about the singular scenario that I mentioned before, this is a picture taken from Quanta Magazine uh, from their piece on our paper using machine learning for, uh, for fluid equations. And essentially, what what you see, they work in a confined cylinder, and everything is asymmetric, and the blow up is going to happen on the plane uh, z is equal to zero, r is equal to one. The fluid is confined to the interior of the cylinder. You also have odd symmetry with respect to z, so that you have two spinning halves in opposite directions. They create secondary currents, and then this produces that the vorticity, uh, which is the curl of the velocity, is going to develop. Uh, as, as time goes by, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and we develop a singularity on the on the boundary. Okay, so so that was sort of the scenario that was conceived, but the, by the dynamics, uh, and moreover, it is asymptotically seems to be asymptotically similar, and I will explain uh, in this context how we found the uh, a very good candidate or the best candidate at that time, uh, sort of picturing. Uh, that that kind of similar. Okay, so so everything uh, starts with burgers, um, which is kind of the simplest PDE uh, that I can think of, uh, and this is kind of how our journey started. I will discuss first results, and then I will discuss methods when it comes to machine learning. So, <clears throat> so if you try to simulate burgers, um, like time-dependent burgers. Uh, then this is pretty much what you see. Okay, so you see a short form. Okay, this is like generic, uh, generic behavior for the PDE at the very top. Okay, if I take some U, uh, this is what is going to happen. Now the <clears throat> uh, the red box here is important because I'm going to choose my red box in a way that um, I will zoom in and rescale at the rate given by this red box. And if I do that, then what I get is something like this. This is a lot nicer. Here, everything is smooth. Here, the gradient blew up. And uh, here, it's, it's, it's great, because it seems to be converging to some kind of stationary solution, pitch point, attractor, something or other. OK, so <clears throat> now. If I were to know what is the, the, the right scaling, what is the right way of zooming in using this red box, I can try and compute solutions in this world, not in here, because here 
if I turn on the computer, things are going to get big very quickly, and, uh, and I'm going to struggle. So, so I don't want to struggle yet. And then I will aim to compute solutions of, of this sort of way. Um, so are these solutions? Well, um, I, can, I can sort of um, write down the way I'm zooming in by means of this, uh, of this variable, uh, one minus t <clears throat> to the one plus lambda. So I'm really trying to figure out at what scale I should, uh, I should zoom in. So lambda is going to be a number um, which has to be determined as part of the PD. And capital U is going to be the scale in this way. So S is the logarithmic subsimilar time. And if I do that, <clears throat> do the change of variables, substitute into the equation, I get something of this time. Okay, so now if you remember the video that I put before, what I'm really looking for is a stationary solution of this equation. Okay, so, so I'm guessing that there is such a solution. This is something that I'm betting on. Um, and then I'm trying to find it. Okay, so that's some kind of leap of faith. Uh, but otherwise, if, if there is no structure to the solution, there is really no way, no way to get started. So now my job uh, has become to find stationary solutions of uh, of one. Okay. Now <clears throat> life is good uh, because if I if I write y of u instead of u of y for for this equation here, I can solve explicitly or well implicitly depending on how you write. Um, so I can write y as a function of u. And, uh, and this is the kind of solution uh, that they get. Y is equal to minus U minus E, which is some free constant, times U to some power. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if you remember, um, in, in, in the picture that was sort of zooming in, um, the, the resulting profile uh, is uh, smooth. So I'm interested in smooth blow ups, um, and therefore the object that I'm looking for has to be smooth. So in order for that profile to be smooth, for this concrete example, lambda has to take some distinguished value. And it is given, in this case, we can compute it explicitly uh, by this simple formula, one over the even e. Okay. Um, so so <clears throat> what do we learn from here? And um, how is the general picture? Well, the general picture um, kind of learned out of this example, is the following. So, so there are these four properties that are going to prevail for many PVEs. I don't want to say for all, but for many PVEs, we have encountered that the situation was very similar to this a modulo minor modification. So, <clears throat> if I take a generic lambda and I try to solve the PVE one for a fixed lambda, which is random, uh, then the solution that I'm going to find is non smooth. Okay, so if I if I don't choose lambda well, I won't find the object that I'm looking for. So lambda is really something very distinguished that happens um, not so often. I mean, it's a discrete set. It's a countable set, but, <clears throat> but very small. And there are, though, some values, lambda n, converging to some accumulation point that give, uh, give rise to smooth profiles. The regularity in between these values, lambda n, and, uh, and they are decreasing. So in between one lambda n and the next one increases in n. So as I move with n, my solution will be non-smooth, but first it will be between, say, c1 and c2, then it will be between c2 and c3, then between c3 and c4, and so on. Okay, but, but yet non-smooth to a certain degree. Um, and moreover, there will be some <clears throat> stability change uh, when we move across the smooth profiles. So the ground state, this is in the mathematical physics literature, the first one, the first lambda, is the ground state will be as stable as it can be. Then the first excited state will be more unstable. The second excited state will be even more unstable, and so on and so forth. So the dimension of the unstable manifold is going to grow as we move uh, across these solutions with it. Okay, so that's kind of the meta picture in this uh, in this business of uh, subsimilar solutions. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
principle, we could consider negative lambda and then assume that u is positive finally. Uh, what, what do you mean negative? If, yeah, you see. If, if it is too negative, then things are going to blow up. Yeah, okay, but then assuming that u is positive, that would then be a side condition in u. No, no, this, okay, this is for the, for y positive, u is positive, for y negative, u is negative. We need to consider y negative, that's what you see. You I, I don't understand the question. So, so <laughs> this, this, okay, there are absolute values missing here, if that's what you're complaining about. No, no, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that you consider only positive, this positive no. sequence of positive lambdas. No, 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 lambda can be negative as well. Then your sequence is positive for, for smoothness. Yes. Yes, and, and I'm saying if we make the additional condition that U, capital U is positive, then also a negative sequence will exist. Well, uh, I mean, why? Because here you're going to get negative exponents eventually. I mean, yeah, but, what, but, but that is smooth if U is positive. That's what I'm saying. Okay, we, we, we can talk about I don't think there are any, but we can talk about this later. Okay, okay so, so this is the first problem that. Uh, that we get to to the pin, um, <coughs> and this is how it performs. So we let lambda to be free as a parameter, and we didn't do pretty much anything. And uh, what we did was beyond telling the pin to solve the PVE. Um, and what we found was this uh, first column, which corresponds to the first uh, stable solution. I mean, we imposed that the solution to be smooth, we let lambda be free, um, and uh, we ask, okay, what is what is the, what do you find? No, what is the solution? And then, um, what uh, the machine learning sort of uh, came back with was, well, these profiles, these are u and three derivatives of u, and uh, pretty good errors, let's say, of the order uh, ten to the minus seven in lambda. Okay, so it did a good job. Um, Finding the first small solution. This is not a big feat in the sense that any method that you can think of virtually, unless you do a very bad job, will work. Okay, so this is this doesn't get me excited. I mean, this, this, this is okay. This you can do it any way you want. So <clears throat> now let's look at the second column. The second column is uh, is not so easy anymore because now what we did was to constrain the lambda and to penalize it whenever it get, whenever it got uh, close to this window of 0 0.5. So drive it away from the first smooth solution. And then what it went to uh, was to the second smooth solution. Now, this is not so easy. I mean, you can still do it because burgers is easy and you have a lot of information. And if you know some mathematics, you can, uh, you can make it work and you can understand everything and so on. Uh, but this is not so easy. So, for example, flowing the PDE will not take you there. Flowing the PDE will take you to the first one because it's a stable one. So you will you will get ejected through the unstable manifold if if you try to do something of that flavor in the in the middle column. So <clears throat> we were able to still pick up the solution at lambda to be equal to one quarter uh, with an error of order, let's say, ten to the ten to the minus seven. Okay. So that's. Uh, Yes, sir. I mean, for those of the people who were not there last Friday, perhaps oh. you can just mention what the acronym PIN means. Oh, PIN means a physics in four neural network. Sorry. And then another experiment that uh, that we tried, and I will explain the method. I will explain uh, how the system is set up later on as I as I go after uh, the results. So the rightmost column is we fix lambda. We try to a value that uh, gives something which is non-smooth. We try to compute, and uh, this is what we get. So um, good accuracy and uh, good results, even when the object is not is not super smooth. Okay, so um, so that's <coughs> kind of our first result. This is uh, this is how we got started in the problem, and uh, and this is when we really started to get excited about the, the potential and the capabilities of this method um, for finding. So similar solution. Okay, um, so so the natural complaint is well, yeah, it's burgers, it's one D, and it's local. Uh, let's try something hard. So um, then we started with something that was 
non local, um, but 1D. Okay, so one of the models that comes from 3D Euler um, is something called the Gregorio equations or the generalized Gregorio equations, where <clears throat> this is a transport equation for the vorticity. Uh, so omega here plays the role of the vorticity, and the relation between u and omega is given by this non local operator. H is the Hilbert transform, uh, the Laplacian is the Laplacian. Okay, so it's a uh, the square root of the Laplacian. Uh, if you a scale of that, just think of it as being some Fourier multiplier. Okay, so <clears throat> again, we're going to try to solve this PV using uh, a similar answer, to try to find some similar solutions of this PV. Okay, so this was sort of our next uh, project in, in, in this uh, hierarchy of more and more complicated solutions that we fed into the neural network. So, <clears throat> same trick, substitute. By the similar answers, um, compute u, like big u, big omega, and we are left now uh, to solve that uh, non local uh, PDE over there. Okay, so, um, so we need to find omega, and then u is coupled through omega via this, <coughs> this single integral pair. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's the plan. Um, there is one degree of freedom that we want to get rid of um, because there is still a scaling symmetry even after going to subsimilar. And then we're going to fix one representative of the class of solutions by imposing this completely arbitrary condition uh, uh, in the form of some value of a derivative of C. Okay? The two is could be really any positive number. Okay, so that's what we fed. Uh, before us, um, this equation has some traction. So it was proposed by, <clears throat> in the case alpha, in the case A is equal to zero, by Constantin Lax and Maida, again as a model for 3D order, 3D Navier spokes, and they have been able to compute explicit self similar blow up solutions. And this is a nice trick. You go to complex analysis and you can solve, uh, you can solve the TV. Um, in, <coughs> in the case where a is equal to negative one. This is also uh, 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 an equation that has a name in the literature known as the Cordova Cordova Fontelos equation. And for that equation, using PDR estimates, for example, you can prove that there is fine time singularity. But there is no information whatsoever uh, about some similar proof. Uh, Castro and Cordova proved that if you take A negative, there is blow up. Uh, if you take A, Positive but very small, perturbing from the case is equal to zero. Uh, like Indian John constructed a similar blow up. And uh, recently, A is equal to one. Uh, and then later, A is smaller or equal to that, than one uh, was also proved to, to blow up in a self similar way. The former by Chen, Hao, and Huang, and the latter by Huang, Qing, Wang, and Wei. Um, <clears throat> a little bit before us, and there was a numerical paper by Wuznikov, Silandia, and Siegel, uh, where they have computed a very big range of parameters, and they have found using very different techniques based on continuation and uh, complex analysis methods, uh, self similar solutions. And this has been for, for uh, many years, not just uh, zero, um, or, or there are also other exceptional values, but for many, many years. Um, so, this is the paper that we uh, looked at. This is a figure from their paper, well, adapted to our setting. Um, they had a lot of data, they reported a lot of um, a lot of the findings, and uh, we fed that equation to the team. It, it's somewhat difficult to compare the profiles, but it was a lot easier to compare the scale. So for every A, um, there is a lambda associated to the scaling of the self similarity. And what we plotted here was our results in blue versus their results in black. Okay, using completely different methods, I would say pretty good agreement. Okay, these are also uh, other um, other plots that also showcase uh, good agreement. For example, for A is equal to zero against the against the explicit solution, and for some other A's versus. Uh, versus the result. So we were very happy 
because we were recovering the results. I mean, in principle, this solution should be should be the same using a totally different method that was very far. So <clears throat> let me focus specifically about the case A is equal to minus one. And I'm going to also discuss here and introduce the role of viscosity that I mentioned before that you could put into the model. So if A is equal to negative one, uh, this, is, this is the CCF model, and uh, you can take what you wrote before, and on top of that, add some viscous term, which is a fractional ablation of a certain strength denoted by alpha. So <clears throat> if you don't do anything, and alpha is zero, then, as I mentioned before, there is blow up. So you should expect that if you put a little bit, um, you may still have blow up, namely because the blow up is driven by the nonlinear terms, and then the, the diffusion acts on a scale that are much slower than the actual blow up. So in other words, the, the, the blow up happening is not really destroyed by the diffusion because the diffusion goes a lot slower. Okay, so that's the case. And that was true uh, uh, for the cases whenever alpha is between zero and one half. Um, now, if you are on the other range, whenever alpha is big, uh, then the diffusion dominates over the nonlinear terms. And then effectively what you have is some kind of heat equation that will die out independently of, of your nonlinear. Okay, so that, <clears throat> um, that uh, concluded the proof whenever for global web postness, whenever alpha is greater than equal than one. So, so there are two scenarios. If you put very little viscosity, there is blow up. If you put a lot of viscosity, there is global web postness. In between, nobody knows. So, <clears throat> so let's see what happens in between. If we let's go to some similar coordinates again. Remember that uh, all we are aiming is to prove a picture of this plane. So if we do that, we get the same thing as before. Uh, and then here we have this extra term coming from the diffusion. Now, if I look at it as a function of S, um, there are two different behaviors here, depending on whether the exponent that multiplies the S is positive or negative. So if it is positive, then, then well, then, then it's bad. Uh, but if it is negative, so if this condition is met, then this is going to be an exponentially decaying small term, which is good because then I can treat it as a, as a forcing, which is going to be very small. It may move this point around a little bit, but it won't destroy the general character of, of, this, of this neighborhood. So the arrows may, may move a little bit, but all in all, they're going to point in. And this is really what is going on. So if I can find a, a solution for which alpha satisfies this constraint here, then we're good. And then this is not going to really matter. It will create a few more pages of energy estimates, but beyond us will be fine. Now, how does this translate in, in our equation? Well, if alpha um, is uh, between zero and one, then lambda has to be given by this formula over here, by this constraint. And in particular, if we want to say something in the open range between one half and one, then uh, lambda has to be negative than one, okay. uh, smaller than one. If we go back, well, life is tough. Okay, it's something like 1.1. Okay, so using this solution, we will be able to say something in some part of the range for which it was proved before that there was blow up. So, okay, that was. <laughs> Sort of enlightening, but but sad. Uh, but if you remember, like the, the general features of like what we saw in the Perkers equation, there is a discrete set of admissible lambdas, and then we found the next one, and the next one is smaller than the first one, which is about one point two. It's <clears throat> about zero point six, and that one is in the good range. It will allow to say something in the open range of viscosity. So now we can say something according to the uh, algebraic condition that I, that I wrote before um, that will lead to a proof of blow up in the open range. So now we can compare the profiles for the two lambdas, the one that we call the stable one versus the one that we call the unstable one. And I will get into the stability in a few slides. So we found 
an unstable solution that is an untrivial eigenvalue at some value of mu that doesn't seem to have any kind of physical meaning or, or related to the equation or the imbalance of the equation in any way. Um, and if we were to prove uh, that these things exist, it would lead to a proof of law for alpha. And again, I'm sort of uh, simplifying a little bit the numbers and making it into nice uh, rational fractions. Um, so for alpha smaller than three things. And there have to be more solutions, again, as in the case of burgers, sorted by their degree of instability, or in other words, uh, by the dimension of the unstable number. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, what we can prove. We're sort of finalizing the proof. It's long, uh, but I will explain a few of the details, in particular the, the ones that are really more appealing for this audience that correspond to the computer chip. So essentially, this is writing what I said in the previous slide. Um, the dimension of the unstable manifold in that case is one, uh, and we can find <coughs> for dimension one smooth neighborhood of initial data such that it leads to, to blow up uh, in, this, in this case where the dissipation is below uh, three fields. Okay, so this is a plot on the stability that I mentioned before. Um, the equation has two trivial eigenvalues that correspond to translations in time of the blow up time, like infinitesimal translations of the blow up time and the blow up point. So if we, we with a simple calculation, can tell you what are those eigenvalues, they are zero and one, um, and you can do the calculation by hand and even compute the eigenvector. So we uh, make the experiment to fit the eigenvalue problem into the beam as well. And this is what it output. So instead of zero, it gets 0 0.00004, and instead of one, you get a similar uh, result, the comparison of the errors between the uh, output of the pin and, and the explicit eigenfunction function are quite good. And on top of that, it says like, look, there is also some other eigenvalue at some value uh, close to 0 0.36, um, and uh, this is how it looks, okay? And the error, this is the residual, is comparable to, to the other. Okay, so let me show uh, a few pictures of how in practice uh, the, training, the training works. So the training means uh, the iterations of the candidate for solution um, throughout, throughout the process. So we can see that it starts sort of very far and eventually it sort of gets, uh, gets to the right spot. And we can also, <clears throat> Uh, plot the errors over over training, and even the errors in this way uh, pair together with the value of lambda as we move as we move forward the training. There is some jump here. I will explain uh, why is that. And uh, the two equations that we are solving are the one given by the PDE. And remember, we have this uh, coupling between u. And omega, so that u prime is given by the super transform of omega. So we, we put that as, a, as another equation in, uh, in the field. Okay, so h long is our implementation of the of the field terms. Okay, so all that from one d. Uh, let's go to two d. So so we started working on. On this equation, which is called the Cousinesque equation, which is a closed casting of the 3D Euler in the presence of a boundary. So this equation is set on the half plane, uh, which shows the upper, it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> and here you can see sort of a similar structure as in Euler. So there is a velocity, which is incompressible, and the temperature, which is uh, driven by, uh, by the velocity, given by this data. Again, we go to some similar, we look for steady solutions. This is how uh, the steady solution of the system for the steady solution looks like. Um, I don't like the pressure. I'm going to get rid of that in a minute. Uh, and the point is that if we were to find some similar solutions of this equation here, we could say something about the 3D Euler equations in the interior of the city. Okay, so if we go to vorticity formulation uh, and take curves so that uh, we get rid of the pressure, 
we take omega to be the term of u and phi and c the derivatives of theta um, then this is the system that we have to solve for our variables omega u uh p m c okay the nice thing about this is that there is no pressure anymore uh, the equations are local so if, if you were to try to invert the pressure you, you have to invert some laplacian and if what you're looking for is highly multi-scale then you are led to have to invert the matrix with, <coughs> with the massive condition number and very big entries and very small entries at the time and this is really a challenge when it comes to to that sort of calculation so uh, we don't do any of that uh, and the price that we pay is because the vorticity formulation there are more variables uh, and so on so we're going to impose again some symmetries we're going to allow our solutions to grow at infinity so u is going to be allowed to grow at infinity sublinearly and again we get rid of this uh, extra scaling by imposing this uh, extra condition okay um the point of this slide is to convince you that if you and believe me that the calculation <laughs> is correct is that if you take three the Euler, uh, you go to axis symmetric, you identify variables in that way, you go to some similar, then what you get is precisely Pusinets as before, mm. modulo this term E1 and this term E2. Now, if you are in the right range of lambdas, both E1 and E2 are exponentially small. So if you were to solve the former, then you can solve the latter again modulo an exponentially small uh term in the form of a form okay so so this is the relation between these two these two closed classes okay so <clears throat> what is the setup uh, this is kind of a generic picture for a neural network and essentially what is happening here is that there is a highly nonlinear output uh, as a function of the inputs the input is going to be uh, my points x or x y and then I'm going <clears throat> every time that I move from one column to the next one, I'm going to apply some affine change of variables um, composed with something highly nonlinear, which uh, we're going to take to be the hyperbolic time. And then we're going to apply this again and again and again and again. Um, so this is going to be really hyperbolic time and of affine, hyperbolic time of affine, and so on and so forth. And now my variables for, for this uh, black box. Uh, are going to be the w's and the b's so i'm going to try to say something i'm going to try to construct my highly nonlinear function by playing around with the values of the w's and the b's okay so this is a minimization problem and uh, what i'm going to try to do is pick the w's and pick the b's in a way that these terms are uh, coming from the first ones coming from the boundary condition, for example, plus all the others that I, um, that, I, that I wrote before, as well as the ones coming from the equations, this is all a sum of, <clears throat> sum of squares, um, they get to be as small as possible. Okay, so, so we will try to minimize over the W's and the V's in order to make these algebraic expressions to be, to be zero ideally but in practice they will be fairly small okay these are the kind of equations that we're going to solve one two and three and six uh are uh sorry one two three and five are are the equations from the pde six is simply the definition of omega the curve of u and four is the compatibility condition between p and c so so these are the six things that I'm trying to find the zero for plus the boundary conditions. And this is the picture that I that I showed on um on Friday, uh, which corresponds to the solution that we got. So we got uh, this nice picture in terms of omega, p, c, and the use, and these are the errors uh, corresponding to, <clears throat> to that approximate solution of Bucine. We also were able to compare uh, our lambda with the one reported by uh Lou of how um so this was early to 2022 uh and this was by then uh, the best uh, self-similar solution uh, corresponding to to this problem okay a few words about why you saw the diff uh, in the error this has to do with the optimizer that we use we use in the beginning 
a first order a stochastic gradient descent such as Alan, and you see here, for example, the spikes. This is because of the stochasticity, but it's trying to avoid the local minima. And then, once we are confident that we are close to an approximate solution, we hit it with the Quasimildo method, which is which is second order. It is also important to notice that the, the, the choice of the excess at which we evaluate is, in principle, arbitrary. It is there is no mesh, so it's a meshless method. Um, we select the collocation points randomly according to a uniform distribution that has two layers, one very close to the origin, which is precisely the point where the non-smoothness happens. So we want to really put a lot of importance in something around the origin because that's where the non-smoothness is going to appear. And then <clears throat> another layer corresponding to, uh, to the bug. Okay, we have to avoid effects from infinity and change variables into this uh, exponential coordinates. So the 15 that you see is really e to the 15. We are really simulating in a massive grid. Um, and we took about 10,000 collocation points, which is not a lot by, today, uh, by today's modern standards. We also took uh, about 300, so a little bit more than 300,000. Okay, uh, maybe I can show uh, a few a few pictures of how the training looks like uh, throughout the iteration. So this is you see a lot of wiggling in the beginning. This corresponds to the out phase, uh, and then once the LGFPS kicks in, then it's really <coughs> imperceptible for uh, for the blocks. And the errors sort of follow. Uh, kind of a similar um, We also play just to ensure. I mean, this is an numerical, this is an numerical result. So there is, but then there was no theorem or no guarantee that we, get it, <coughs> that we were getting the right thing. Um, so we did play a little bit with this uh, scaling parameter. We normalized to different values, recovered the output of the of the pin, then renormalized back again and showed that indeed all the curves that we were getting were really overlapping into the same. So we were really um, getting a very robust, um, same representative actually of, of the solution, even if we pick our normalization differently. We also <coughs> make with our domain size. Uh, so as before, we were taking things between 10 to the 10, 10 to the 15, even more, uh, and see, for example, the effect that it had this truncation um, of the domain, even to very, very large numbers in uh, the estimate of lambda, and also <coughs> the rates of convergence of, uh, of, of the lambda as well. Okay, so by, by, I mean, this is meant to be a numerical test of the robustness of the computations. I don't claim that this is a theorem of any sort, but uh, we wanted to be mm -hmm. sure that uh, what we were getting was actually a solution and not some random garbage that we didn't know. Okay, so let me say a few words uh, about, uh, about the computer assisted proof. And here I'm going to go back and talk about uh, the CTF result. And I'm not planning to give a full proof that will take a lot of lectures. Um, but uh, what I'm planning to do is to highlight maybe some ingredients that potentially may be useful for other situations, for other PD, for some observations of things that we have found throughout this uh, journey of uh, figuring out how to prove um, the stability when actually. Okay, so the so good news this is, uh, this is a linear problem. Okay, so. Before we start, um, there are several considerations. This basis, let me call it like that, of hyperbolic time composed with a fine composed with, if you try to do a computer system proof with that, um, you will very likely fail um, because of precisely what makes it good for the machine learning. So all this highly nonlinear stuff is going to lead to <clears throat> dramatic wrapping effects and, and you will be destroyed very, very quickly. So we take the output from the machine learning, uh, we reinterpolate it in our favorite basis that is going to be 
better suited for this uh, this part of of the computer system. The computer system truth. Not that we we are allowed to do that in the sense that we don't need to really take what the output of of the pin, but rather some other approximate solution that uh, works in our favor for this part of the loop. Okay, we we pick the my functions. This is a, a set of orthonormal functions in N two in a two of R, uh, and we at this point we forget about everything we knew about <coughs> machine learning error. Okay, so so this is a given function. Uh, we just take it as granted. We start working from it. Okay, we're going to also pick some special norm, which is going to be some <coughs> weighted norm, uh, and I'm going to lie a little bit in the next five slides or so. So forgive me, but uh, I will try to make it um, more comprehensible at the expense of lying something. Um, but it's all like that. Um, so, so yeah, so so we optimize our weight, uh, looking at some bad terms and kind of designing very carefully um, the weight for these weighted norms. Uh, we're going to remove the effects from coming from infinity and uh, work with uh, something called Z coordinates. That are related to y coordinate point one d uh, via this um, this uh, isolation over there. So the issue by doing that is okay. We we now infinity is good. Infinity is very small. Uh, things decay very nicely at infinity. Um, the first issue is that the Hilbert transform becomes a horrible operator. Um, fortunately, it's not as horrible as we thought in the beginning. Because it's still a convolution type, this is not trivial to prove. Um, but but you can rewrite uh, you can rewrite the the Hilbert transform now in these coordinates as some kind of convolution with a different kind. Uh, and uh, another bad news is that after changing uh, coordinates, then whatever it was at dy becomes some mess involving torch and dz and sigma and so on. So more work. Okay, so moving forward. <clears throat> Bad news, uh, the linear operator is non symmetric, not even, I mean, constant coefficients would be like a dream, but uh, the <clears throat> linear matrix is not going to be permission, so that's going to be really <clears throat> an issue. So, not even close to symmetric, near, not even perturbatively or anything like that. Um, we're going to have unstable finite modes. Um, the low modes are not going to work in our favor. Tail may be okay, and everything is going to mix up very quickly. So if we try to do like silly things, it won't work. Um, good news, TPUs are cheap these days, <laughs> and we can parallelize in a very dumb way. Um, so so at least we can sort of outsource uh, this problem to many CPUs in uh, in a simple way. Like things don't talk to each other too much. So, so then, for example, if we were to compute things from a matrix, we can just give a bunch of uh, a bunch of entries to to everything. <coughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to have four ingredients. The first ingredient is how you would start. You have an approximate solution, compute the effect. Um, this is the easiest part. So you take <clears throat> your linear operator, which is going to be of the form some function times omega plus some other function times omega prime plus no local stuff um and that is something that you <clears throat> that you have to first find an approximate eigenpair and then bound this quantity and uh, rigorously okay so that's well that's one thing you have to do you also have to do kind of a similar thing for the effect and um, but in general we have to develop like a good integrator which was fast also to Care of the tails, and we accomplish that by using a Gaussian under quadrature of order four, and then control the tails by asymptotically expanding that. Ingredient two, as I said before, the linear operator is uh, is not self adjoint, so the associated matrix is not going to be non permission. It's not going to be non normal either. So that, and then <clears throat> well, this has some funny consequences that. Even if the spectrum of A is on the left half plane, you may grow for a little bit of time. Um, in the long run, you will decay, uh, but you may grow. This is known as a, some transient growth, and there is something called the Christ constant, which is tied to that and quantifies or gets a bound 
on how fast you could in principle grow. Yeah, you, you could in principle grow. A uh, problem computing the price constant is is time consuming, is difficult, um, and it's not affordable for us. So so we cannot go through the price constant, and we have to to struggle with the pain of bounding this e to the at. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> as I said, if p is very large, we're in good shape because then the dynamics are really dominated by the eigenvalue. So the first reduction is to well not to have to bound for all p, but just to some capital T um, large enough. And I mean, we know that we will stop as long as this condition is met. Let's say if we were to find the uniform bound. Okay, so that that that's good. Some bad news. Um, if we take intervals, even little intervals of little t, uh, this is also going to be a, a head of a pain because we, once you take the exponential of e to some interval, uh, you're dead. So unless t is like 0 0.0001. Um, so, so you cannot do that. And then what we're going to do <coughs> is to discretize uh, the times for a certain with a certain uh, delta p, and then in between times we are going to use estimates on the derivatives of that norm, which we can get a bad bound, let's say. Um, so this now eliminates now there is no wrapping effect, and what we have is a bunch of these three times um, that we need to compute the exponential. But we can do it <clears throat> even better because we only need to take the first exponential, and then once so for t one, once we go to to 2t1, 3t1, and so on, we are only doing multiplication. We don't need to do any exponentiation anymore. So it's a lot cheaper. Uh, <clears throat> the price that we pay, we need to sort of take care of that derivative estimate. But, but uh, the derivative estimate can be controlled by uh, the smallest singular value of, uh, of a matrix. So now, Life is a little better. We need to compute the spectrum of asymmetric matrix. But it's nonetheless not small. So we still want to do well here. Okay. <clears throat> How to do that? Well, the underlying idea is that I want to do as few computations in interval mode as I can possibly as I can possibly do. So I don't want to do any fixed points. Uh, and if possible, I would like to do only a posteriori estimate. And this, in practice, for the sizes of the matrices that we're working with, uh, worked a lot better. So <clears throat> what we use is the following lemma. Uh, this was proved in another paper of mine with Gerardo Riols that eventually says if you construct, uh, you take a symmetric matrix, you construct an approximate <clears throat> orthonormal basis any way you want, as long as you satisfy this bound, then you can find the true eigenbasis satisfying this bound. And the constants are not optimized there, um, but that does the job. So, so then what we are left to, to really verify is this condition, which, which is for us much faster than trying to set it up as some kind of fixed point uh, or, or maybe some other more complicated stuff. And the idea is that okay, we're going to use Lapa for, um, for, the, for the numerical guess. Um, so you can construct some numerical guess given by the tildes, and then the eigenvalues of n are very close to the eigenvalues of this matrix here, which is uh, almost there. I mean, up to small perturbation terms. And then once we are in something which is very close to diagonal, diagonally dominant, we apply the scoring, um, and, uh, and we're done. Okay, so that <coughs> results in being uh, faster than every other thing that we try. This was enough, and it was faster than the thing we tried before. Okay, ingredient three. Um, we have to do, <clears throat> and again, I'm hiding under the bar a lot of stuff. Suppose that we take now four derivatives, we work in some weighted H4 space, and we have to <laughs> show energy estimates of this label. Um, so that in practice, somehow the low modes really contain, really <coughs> uh, compound the rest of, solute of the solution. So that if I compound the low modes, then I compound the whole thing. Okay, that, that's, that's the underlying idea. That low modes control everything. So now we sort of have to, have to really first translate 
uh, the, the, linear, the linear operator into something depending on the low modes and then uh, deal with those low, low modes for that part I want to explain it here. So, <clears throat> so we want to get some estimate of this flavor. Uh, there are two cases. One case is well, if, if the omega is low frequency, uh, <laughs> then again it's a matrix, and putting this estimate is equivalent to showing that the largest uh, eigenvalue of a certain matrix is uh, smaller than the minus one half. Okay, so that's same thing as before. So for similar uh, similar ideas with the posterior verification. And then for the time modes, uh, this is gone. And then doing energy estimates, you can get a sign, you can get a good sign, also choosing an appropriate weight. Uh, and what you're left with, remember that your four derivatives are the low order terms. So the low order terms, you're going to now use this assumption on the high frequency. <clears throat> and now in the high frequency analysis, we do energy estimates. So a canonical term is of this form. Some kernel, some derivatives acting on omega, and some derivatives acting on uh, omega z, and some derivatives acting on omega z prime. If we have top order, we do the thing by fan, integrate by parts, and so on, that's fine. And if we are not top order, then we can play factors of one over n, which is the frequency cutoff, with the regard. <laughs> and, and we're fine because we're not top order. So we have some room to spare that gives us uh, powers of n to, to trade. So that then the norm of these guys is going to be some power of n times some constant. And in order to bound that constant, we use sure or variance of sure, depending on the term, that somehow essentially uh, tell us to, to sort of bound these integral kernels in some way of this flavor or a small variation of the law. Okay, and now combining all these ingredients plus the ones that didn't show up, uh, we sort of get um, the, the, the desired uh, stability. And you can conclude from there after you go also throughout all the nonlinear times. Let me go with that. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, were there any questions or complaints I'm supposed to ask, right? Yes. Okay, I, will, I need to bring you the microphone because they want to record also the question. But you can just hold it and. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it works right. The mic, okay. So thank you for your wonderful talk. So about the Rigorous and value calculation for the matrix. I think in the last third or four pages, you use a gauge golem theorem to bound the angle value, right? Uh, at the very end. I mean, we, we reduce. Uh, maybe pre oh, yeah, this page, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we reduce the eigenvalues of M yeah. to the eigenvalues of this mm. uh, matrix here, yeah. which is very close to the mm. So S mm. tilde is an, is an unrecognized mm. approximation mm. of the eigenbasis. Mm. So, so I just one short comment. Yes. So, uh, you see, uh, I think this we we can have the bound for all angle value, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, yeah. So, Sometimes, if we just for uh, focus on several angle values, mm -hmm. yeah, then maybe I. Very uh, true, but in certain in certain parts of the problem, I need to bound the whole spectrum of the matrix. Yeah. I, I don't have the luxury to look at the top or yeah. the second top. Yeah. I, yeah. I really need to bound all of them. Okay, maybe if you are need you need to bond all of them. Just to comment that if we just give bond for one of them or, or several of them, then Sylvester's law is very uh, helpful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had only to bond one, but many times I just need to bond all of them. I need to prove that the smallest is whatever and that all of the others are below. And uh, I really need to have a, a very accurate bound on the whole spectrum. Other questions? Yes, sorry. Yes, I mean, I knew you started with two examples where you had the uh, self simulator on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but sorry, they were not quite exactly the same, but is it? I mean, what's the trick there? What, once you have a new PDE, then is, is it always almost the same self simulator on that? Or this is also something you need to work on? Ah, it, it depends. I mean, I'm sure it's an PDE that doesn't have any self similar solutions. But if you think even physically, this is most stable. Typically, so we which uh, there is also a practical thing is that if, if there is nothing to get a hold of, then I don't know where to start. Um, so so 
combining this wishful thinking and uh, the fact that so far every PBE seems to have a solution of this flavor, um, well, it leads us to hope that there has to be something there. But, but of course, you're not that. So uh, this is part of your bet. Like when you start, you say, well, I'm betting on my solution having a certain structure because otherwise I, I don't know what to do. And then if you meet, meet. But we're confident that uh, such a thing exists and, and maybe able to find a profile with more effort uh, or less effort, depending on the case. And we have been successful at least at an unregulated level in, in finding this. But, but it is hard. And this is, I mean, I, I always think like when, whenever I was trying, so there is, and, and I mean, before machine learning, I tried to work on this problem using uh, uh, traditional methods uh, with different degrees of success. Uh, and then, you know, you, you start failing and you keep failing and fail, 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 fail. And, and well, in the beginning, you say, well, it's my own incompetence. No, so you keep trying. Uh, but eventually, you keep up because then, okay, maybe there is nothing there. So, so there is a little bit of uh, faith into thinking that there is really a solution there. Uh, but so far, well, we are optimistic and we have been quite successful in, in finding these new solutions that nobody has offered before of uh, the similar plan. Thank you. Sure. Well, no, it's fine. I mean, so like this. Yeah. Um, so now, so you were saying that you were failing with the traditional methods, and now with the theme, you're getting it. So it means that you're staying there. You're not coming back. Oh no, no, I'm trying to do both things uh, because you can blend uh, also uh, things from the traditional world into into the theme. But no, I think that the uh, the benefit is to really exploit both. So, so use things that could come from the traditional world, or even information from mathematical discovery or properties of the solution, or, or things like that, and blend it back into the pin to give you more mathematical insights and, and, and sort of close the cycle like that. So, I think that uh, the, the, the nice thing and the uh, profitable uh, way of doing this is by putting both together and incorporating both into the mix. So it's not like one or the other. I, I, I think it's both. Yeah, well, there was one at the back, so. An excellent talk, I really love that. Thank you. How careful you were reading the pen and how carefully you were getting that. So many, 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 many uh, blow up them. And there were tons of terrible games with that terrible narratives, and they also had terrible numbers. Are we going to see the same thing happening again with all these new people? We're going to look at people that are sort of rather much data and say, I found that blow up in that case. So, or what? I call I, I, I so the kind of, of movement that this kind of group does. I'm really worried about what's happened. What do you think? Okay, so, what if happen? Um, I hope it doesn't. Um, it's hard to tell, but uh, you could have been sort of, uh, I don't know, know being more able to use more. We, we try to be careful. So, again, there are good numerics and bad numerics. No, uh, the question is, are there going to be bad numerics in the near future? Most likely, but, uh, but I hope we are. Can this be used to produce garbage? Absolutely. Um, but I sincerely hope that people don't misuse it or that they try to be careful uh, and, and so on. I think the, the community is more, it's more accessible. Um, community is more aware of, you know, what is the good standard. Um, so you really have to provide like very good idea. I mean, a proof would be ideal, but if you're thinking about like a physics paper or something like that, then really convincing arguments that you have been careful and so on. And this is something that we uh, really saw when trying to publish the paper. So we were, we, we put a ton of effort into trying to sort of show that we have been careful. Referees asked us for even more effort. So we had to spend a lot of time really doing more tests and polishing everything. Um, so I hope that this is now the, this is now the standard, but 
Of course, you can deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, it's getting more popular, but we'll see. Thanks. Okay, I think we will leave it at that and let's thank our speaker.